our first speaker this morning is Mr. Tommy Lindstrom, who is the project manager at the Energy Agency for South East Sweden. And the topic is bio LNG to support regional development and resilience. So thank you very much, Tommy. Dear all participants <clears throat> and you online, uh, I wish you welcome to this short presentation about our experience of bio LNG in the southeast of Sweden. So let's see if I can get my presentation started because we have some different challenges than the rest of Europe due to many regulations that have changed due to the economics of natural gas due to their supply system and due to uh, many, many local entrepreneurs who would like to join together or by themselves produce biogas, which takes us all the way from small farmers to very big industrial production plants. So this is quite a, a common map. You have seen it before. The gas net of Europe. And if you find, look at the blind spot, where there are no gas grid at all, you find southeast Sweden. Well, almost all of Sweden and Finland, actually. But we still have 15, 20 years of experience. So in 2007, it was actually, uh, a group of very interested people in biogas, uh, farmers, association of farmers, sat down and said, we like biogas, but we want to do more than just produce electricity for our farms. We see a potential for biogas to, as a substitute for the regional goal of becoming fossil free by 2020. Later it will change to 2030, but it, it started that discussions. And politicians were on board, uh, distributors were on board, producers were on board, so we started this very informal network of collaboration, but uh, most important was to have a common strategy for biogas in the region. And also we focused a lot of the cooperation between municipalities as end users, but also provider for permits for the filling stations and uh, production plants, etc. So we had a perfect storm of people coming together to start this network. And we also made quite a bold strategy for being back in uh, 20, 2008. To become fossil free in public transport by 2020, that was far away. I mean, we were 12 years before 2020 and we had like 98% of all the fossil for public transport were fossil mostly diesel. So uh, we had long discussions because we very early uh, pointed out that uh, public transport is the key. If they change into biogas, we will have a market for production and distribution. We will have a, a final customer that ha can handle the volumes that we need for the production to be successful. And the region, who is in charge of the public transport, they listened. So in the procurement they did in 2015 to start 2018, first they made a 10-year contract, would normally will be five or six years, but in this case, they made 10 years contract just in order to provide the possibility and time for those who handed in uh, uh, an offer for the uh, procurement uh, to actually have the time one or two years to implement a filling station where they lived. So the region uh, set up in the procurement that it's, we will only handle interests of 100% renewables. Uh, and in that time when it came out, 2015, uh, we still didn't have filling stations all around the region. Uh, we had on a few places. So they decided that, okay, we start off with 80% biogas for regional buses and 20% HVO 
what in the time was accessible and available, at least the 100% version of HVO. These are an actual map of the filling stations as it is today in southeast Sweden. We started with one filling station, 2008. And for the moment, we have also one LNG station. And we have further two or three uh, that is processing permits. So yes, we did it. And we thought, yay, <laughs> what a great achievement. And the municipalities, of course, joined in and set aside for their own fleet of cars, uh, 30, 40 cars, uh, to run on biogas when the filling station came. Uh, and luckily, we have a lot of interest from local entrepreneurs who started filling stations, a chain of filling stations. So we were not dependent on the big actors, the international marketer, actors on the market. So, uh, for the moment, in red, you can see the production plants we have now. at more or less 80 kWh, not that much. Uh, but in the planning, where they have come from constructing and are very close to be uh, commissioned, to the ones who have recently received the permits and been granted subsidies and uh, organizing the investments for the plants. And as you can see, we are now close to 230 gigawatt hours of bio LNG. Because transporting compressed gas is a bad business. It's a very bad business. You can't gain anything from that. You can transport it, well, like 30, 40 kilometers, but it doesn't become uh, very economical for large distances. So bio LNG and micro LNG is a very welcome solution to our challenges. And here are the actual prices from yesterday. And this is a part of Sweden just north of the southeast corner uh, who has 100% bio LNG. As I mentioned in the beginning, we have no national gas grid. Only a small part in the western side of Sweden. And as you can see, we have very, very compatible prices. Because this market is totally disconnected from the national gas market. And this is what I would say the future of bio LNG. Because in other parts of Sweden, uh, especially the southern part close to Copenhagen, Malmö, when they actually have a gas grid, in order to secure supply of biogas, they said that, okay, we can do a mix of 50% bio LNG with 50% LNG. And they are at six euros a kilo. So uh, there are big differences in prices in Sweden. And all depends on being connected and depending on the, the price of natural gas or not. We also started, not we, but on the national side, we started a project. I did participate in the project. Uh, we set up to um, enhance and improve the market for long haul transport using bio LNG. And the aim was, this was started in 2010, and our aim was to, in the coming years, it ended last year, was to have at least 10 trucks running on bio LNG in Sweden. And the interest was overwhelming. We now have 580 trucks running on bio LNG in Sweden. And as you know, the energy, um, the energy power of bio LNG is higher in density than uh, hydrogen. So even if we had a hydrogen market in Sweden and we had filling stations and infrastructure, 
that the truckers will still use bio-LNG. You get further. It's more energy density. So there are almost once a month we are opening a new filling station for bio-LNG in Sweden. Once a month. And this is normally thanks to a lot of interest from Finnish investors like Gasum and ST1. But also, uh, I should say, uh, the Danish company, which recently, now it's a shell company. Or <laughs> yeah, yesterday I think it was published. Uh, Nature Energy from Denmark is now belonging to Shell. But they also started to operate in Sweden. But of course, uh, we were happy to have such a, a good market of compressed biogas. And as you see, we had great potential bio LNG. But then we have this prices in Euro LNG. You all know about that. That was challenge number one. As I said, in the, some parts of Sweden, we do have a gas grid. The prices went up to six euro a kilo. Uh, yes, thank you. And it wasn't going to stop there. It was the chronicle of a death foretold, and that was the emission for light vehicles uh, that has been approved now by the commission as of 2035, you cannot sell cars with higher emissions than 50 grams per kilometer. And that is the death of the combustion engine. And of course, that makes the market of compressed biogas for light vehicles very, very complicated. And we were hoping that other manufacturers worldwide would see the European market as a possibility. But as you cannot sell the cars, as of 2035, it becomes very difficult. And you need to remember that the European market of biogas cars in the world is only 15%. Not many think that. Many people know think that Europe, oh, you must be the leaders in, in biogas cars, but in fact, we're not. We're only 15% of the market. So that was another obstacle or challenge for us to overcome. And we did try our best. Uh, we made calls to all the MEPs of the parliament, especially the Nordic ones, trying to make them change their mind and, and just change the mind of their colleagues, at least. Um, to have, we had a Finnish proposal about you should do an acceptance for, for biogas or compressed biogas in this new normative of emissions for light vehicles. Unfortunately, we tried to, as Don Quixote, uh, fight the windmills, but <laughs> the Nordic countries are very few in the big gang of 27, so we didn't have much, much success with that. And of course, when something gets, the rumor gets around that, Biogas for cars are going out of business. Mm. People started, as always, the humanity do that, to look at the next big thing. Okay, what's next? And what's next for many politicians is technologies that is not yet there yet. They look for something, technology answer to all, will solve everything in the future, like hydrogen or electric cars. Uh, but I mean, I had my first electric car 10 years ago, and I had a range of 20, uh, 200 kilometers on a good day. On a bad day, in winter, I was lucky to get 100 kilometers of range. Uh, but I mean, the situation has improved. So many were interested in our corner of Sweden to, okay, okay, biogas cars, maybe we should also have some electric cars. And this is an Inauguration in a small municipality, only, only 15,000 inhabitants. Uh, the municipality bought 18 electric cars for their fleet of uh, elderly care and social care. And they had this big inauguration with speakers and uh, they built up a, a fantastic charging uh, platform. They could charge almost all the cars at once <clears throat> because they needed always to have to be standby for any uh, 
anything that could occur with uh, elderly care. Uh, and as you know, in Sweden, elderly care, people are left to live in their houses and being attended there uh, two to five times a day by the municipality. So your municipalities have a lot of cars. So that was excellent, I thought. But then we had elections and a new set of politicians entered and said, OK, this um, taking care of the elderly office we have there, I think they should move to another location and uh, join together with some other uh, municipality service. Uh, and we can save some money. And decision was taken and they moved, but the infrastructure of charging was impossible to bring with them. And it was also on another property. So it wasn't a municipality who owned the property. It only made a land lease agreement. So that provides a, a second opinion, uh, especially, okay, so the infrastructure of electric fleets are vulnerable. Uh, they did some resistance. They started an electric carpool with the few cars that remained on this site. They said, okay, we use them daytime and anyone who signed up in our app or something similar can use them in the afternoon or in the night, on the weekends. So they had some use of the infrastructure, but of course there were many millions invested in that. Uh, and the other cars was dispersed around to other uh, municipality divisions um, because they said, okay, this is dangerous to rely on electric cars. We will go back to biogas. It's much safer and much more resilient. And also, uh, the Swedish authorities also looked into this and many procurements for regional buses had switched to electric buses in a high degree, but they started to withdraw the contracts, saying that, okay, we will wait. We will, go, we will not go through with this procurement for the moment. Uh, I think we need to make space for more LNG and CBG buses. And also the authorities thought that it's a very good idea for resilience of the country if you have a big power cut. Uh, of course, you can't fill biogas anyway, but <laughs> it all works with electricity, the filling stations. Uh, but anyhow, they thought that it would be a better idea, and especially to have regional access to biogas. So where were we? We had all these plants that are in upcoming the coming years, where should we go? I mean, it was very clear by the European Union that, well, they said that uh, biogas will, this is before the Ukraine crisis, biogas should be used in maritime transport, long haul transport, and as uh, for electrofuels. And of course, now you know that we will need all the biogas we can uh, get in Europe for the natural gas grid. But for us, as we don't have a grid, we need to look into new possibilities. And actually, sky's the limit for biogas production. I mean, you have animals, you have food waste, you have energy crops, etc., etc. Now coming into another perspective than before. And of course, we are looking into now farmers usually are interested in biogas for their own needs, uh, electricity production, mainly. But now they are looking into, oh, this is a business. I mean, we have the substrate. Uh, we have big roofs for solar panels. We have energy crops. We have biomass. Yeah, we can be energy providers. So we have a new generation of energy farmers upcoming in Sweden. But of course, it all depends on subsidies, long-term decisions, prices, and some other issues that are really out of hand on local level, regional level, and Swedish national level. It depends on European Union and world market things. So in order to make these investments to become energy farmers, 
uh, they need like, we, we need to know the rules for the next 10 years. And as you know, of today, that's impossible to answer that question. So the scale can switch from one side to another on one decision at some level. So there is a risk, as there are in all businesses. So uh, then we asked ourselves, are we ready? Where should we go? Energy farmers, mm, interesting, but it's a, it's a very difficult market. Uh, so we wanted to investigate a bit what the market looks like in especially Nordic conditions for uh, long haul transports in the Nordic countries and Baltic countries, what it looks like in, for maritime transport and uh, electrofuels. So we, we uh, wrote an application to Interreg uh, Baltic, BSR, and we got the project approved and we started October this year. It's called Best Ace, the project. And the aim of the project is to, so uh, we, we set up to, okay, we need to do a roadmap. We need to know what are the key issues for these markets to uptake more bio LNG? Is it legislation? Is it financing, investments, infrastructure? What do we need in order to make this a reality? Because as compressed ga uh, gas for cars are going out to business very, very soon. I mean, I think there is only one supplier of biogas cars now in Europe left. So these markets need to be developed quickly. And we need to know, okay, how is that going to happen? For, for us, it's very, very important. So we are going to set up a state of play, looking into the situation now. Uh, what do, does the market look like? And of course, uh, the national strategies for biogas production. Uh, are there any national support system for this? And we, of course, our aim is to find these roadmaps for the development of bio LNG on the Nordic markets. That we are going to make a final report and we're going to look at it um, on the four markets, we also look in the, in the Baltic countries, we will look into the gas grid, of course. Uh, but for us, it's very important to find this, and this should be concluded in late 2024. I mean, we, we, are, we need to find these new markets quickly for the Nordic countries. And these roadmaps are to be developed by each country, but also look into a Nordic perspective as transport uh, especially the maritime sector, is an international business. And now the big questions. Micro, nano, bio, LNG. Is this just a parenthesis in the transport history? Or is it here to stay? This is a, a gas car in Norway. It's a photo taken in 1917 during World War I. They couldn't find uh, petrol. So they came up with making a gas car like this. So whatever they are in need, and there is circular economy, and you have the substrate locally, you can always depend on regional development in small scale, as long as they are uh, fine entrepreneurs and inventors everything is possible because this is a circular fuel, a circular economy in the best of ways. And with that, I'm done. Thank you very much. Okay, Tommy, uh, uh, thank you very much. It was uh, very inspiring, I suppose, for many regions. Uh, first question. You have started with a focus on the biogas, bio-LNG. And if you could briefly explain what was the mix of the determinants in this 
decision decision making process because i know your uh, let's say vision of being natural renewable in sweden but this is more or less some kind of moral uh, aspect let's call it moral but there is also uh, as you mentioned uh, uh, slowly the bio lng starts to became to uh, to become uh, uh, to become business model there are political issues there are social aspects what is the constellation uh, in our case it was to look at okay if we can produce biogas which market pays the best simple as that and it was the the light vehicle market as a substitute for for um, for petrol mainly and we got on board, and this is another key factor, we got on board the region with the public transport system and also the municipalities who can provide uh, 20, 30 cars, uh, the garbage pickup, etc. trucks, and they can also provide help uh, getting a filling station in place. So that was the perfect mix to start with. But uh, what you are, are investigating in this project is very interesting because we have an industry uh, that in many cases uses LPG for many parts of their production. And this nanoscale LNG would be perfect replacement to that. But I mean, if you have long-term strategies on regional level, I think that's the key factor. And. Uh just jumping uh, to, the, to your last uh, uh, words, because this was my, uh, my uh, second question. Yesterday we uh, heard the question, okay, what was the role of decision-making people? So decision-makers. How much uh, they voice, or they, they, let's say power, uh, plays a role in the whole process? And what about entrepreneurs? Yes, exactly. I mean, that was the, the, the role of the network. So any, anyone on economic work in, uh, in regional level have very little knowledge about how does biogas work? What is the cost of a biogas bus? Uh, uh, how do you create a filling station? Uh, what's the investment? And, and they didn't know that. But being in the network, they learned in the discussions, how it works. And then when they have the insight, it was easy for them to say, okay, let's make a procurement of 100% renewables. So let's say this, this kind of showing them, explaining them, making them aware was a key factor for, for, this, pro, for this decision or not? Yeah, and the secret is, well, you don't speak to them, you speak with them. Okay. Make them participant in the process. Another question? Um, thank, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, you said that the farmers use the biogas to make their own electricity. Um, what is the yeah, energy mix in Sweden? So where the energy comes from? So do you have um, a central electricity network that you can uh, hydropower or something like that? Or do you have very well, um, islands, so uh, um, power islands, so that you have to produce your electricity yourself? No, it's all interconnected. Uh, we have, to, uh, though, uh, four price zones of electricity in Sweden. But our provider is 40% uh, hydropower, 40% nuclear, and 20% renewables, mostly wind power. And other, yeah, just... uh, thank you very much. Really, really interesting. Uh, just the question I have, which is more of a general question, is at the beginning you talked about the successes, uh, especially thinking about the public transport. Um, if you had to do that again, and you can think about challenges as well as successes, if you went through that whole process again, is there anything that you would do differently to bring people on board? 
Um, what could have been done different was to more involve the local transport companies because this tender of public transport were divided into, if I remember correctly, 50 small packages. So it made the possibility for even small transporting companies who have school, school children in one area, uh, uh, made them the possibility to participate in this tender. Um, that's uh, what a good secret, but they need to be more prepared. I mean, we prepared them for two years. So when the decision came, no one protested. 100% renewable. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Great. Thank you very much. I think a uh, round of applause uh, for.